very well understood john praveen hello i said it's praveen here very well understood hi madhura okay. hello everyone hi praveen where are you huh? i'm hello, in praveen. brussels germany oh, right now okay okay ha leaving in a couple of days saturday coming back okay okay yes so yes. Uh, so praveen you heard me saying that i i thought it be might be good to start with you go to chilla shri uh, and leave jerry oh, that bit i didn't understand i i thought it was jerry who was going to start <laughs> is, is is that okay. is that all right no that... I, you are the boss anything you okay. say john <laughs> Uh, I have my reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. But Jerry hasn't right. joined yet, right? Is Jerry not there? He is here. I'm sure he'll come in. Thank you. Uh-huh. So, Avanish is there. Shruti is there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So John Ram said to say he's just landed in Boston. He's going to go to YouTube and be listening to us. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> oh. So how how long is he going to be in Boston? Oh, I, this sounds ridiculous. Just a like a three day trip or something. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So. Well, I wish I were in. I mean, in, I'm in Edinburgh. Otherwise, okay. I'd be. We'd be quite close. uh in eastern ontario and boston okay are, are we on no we're not quite online are we uh, there's some time, there's three more minutes for us to start professor uh, i would like to make a very small announcement uh, to all the attendees and panelists we are recording our session today uh, that is the first announcement and the second one is we're going live uh, we're starting to go live on three platforms which is facebook uh, twitter and youtube uh, i just wanted to let you all know about that we will be joining we'll join by people on other social media platforms as well yeah yes and uh, sujan you'll be telling people about asking questions and so on will yes, you yes yes sir i will no signs of jerry Hmm. Jerry hasn't joined as yet. No. That's Maybe, puzzling. Uh, you could send him a reminder I don't know if you have his yeah number. <clears throat> Was Jerry otherwise is very punctual. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, he had a few online. He's here. He's here. Hi, Hi everybody. How are you? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Hello. Jerry, Hello. I was I was uh, praising you oh, that you're generally very <laughs> punctual. How come you well, have not joined five minutes before the program is due to start? I, I make it one minute to five. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, hi Madhura, how are you? Yeah. Oh, we're oh, always nice touch on my producer Jerry. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So uh, Jerry, I I suggested that uh, I'll ask Praveen to speak first, then Chirashri and let you come up in the tail. That's partly because I will be actually just saying a little bit about some of your findings in Bihar in my in my introduction i thought so i thought perhaps best to let you come in at the end when people have had time to forget what you said right yeah that's right that's right <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> where, where are you from uh, i'm in kasal you know in your home continent ah, i mean your okay. original home continent bihar is your home otherwise <laughs> that's a, a different <laughs> matter <laughs> and uh, and john you're in canada i am actually at the moment in edinburgh yeah. oh, in so edinburgh. it's uh, it's time uh, process i think we'll start the program it's 5 o'clock we'll start on time uh, 
good evening everybody who is joining us from various parts of the globe uh, good morning good afternoon based on where you're joining us uh the colleagues and friends i am sujan the online events coordinator at the foundation for agrarian studies on behalf of the foundation i welcome you all to the symposium on contemporary agrarian relations in bihar uh, before we begin let me briefly introduce you to the foundation's work and the background of this symposium the Foundation for Agrarian Studies is a research organization established as a charitable trust in 2003. We're based in Bangalore. Our major objective is to facilitate multidisciplinary theoretical and empirical inquiry in the field of agrarian studies in India and elsewhere in the developing world. We do so in association with a wide section of people interested in the agrarian question. These include young scholars, senior researchers and academics, members of mass organizations working in the countryside and other professionals. Since 2006, that is for over a decade and a half, the foundation has conducted village studies as part of its project on agrarian relations in India. Uh, in short, uh, PARI. The project has so far covered 27 villages that span over 12 states in the country. A rich database consisting of this data covering various facets of Indian rural life uh, is available to the researchers for use. Uh, this database has also been used to develop research in thematic areas, including small farmers economy, situation of Dalit households in rural India and women's work in the Indian countryside, to name a few. More details on this database and publications based on these, uh, uh, made based on these surveys can be found on our website, that is uh, fas.org.in. Uh, you can find the website in the Q&A box, uh, it will be put there. As part of this project on agrarian relations in India, two villages in Bihar were surveyed in 2012 and 2018. These villages are Katkunya in West Champaran district in the far northwest of the state and Nayanagar in the Samastipur district in central Bihar. Uh, it is the findings from these surveys uh, that form the basis of today's discussion. Detailed studies of different aspects of socio-economic conditions in these two villages were published as research articles and notes in the latest issue of our journal, that is Review of Agrarian Studies. You can find a link to the journal's latest edition, uh, which is volume 12, number one in the chat box. Uh, let me also say that the Review of Agrarian Studies is the in-house journal of the foundation, which uh, has completed 10 years of its publication in 2021. It is a biannual peer-reviewed open access online first then print journal of international repute and has been recognized by many academic platforms. Uh, coming to today's symposium, Professor John Harris, Emeritus Professor Simon Fraser University will chair the symposium. Uh, Professor Harris has written a very rich introduction to the set of articles that are under discussion. He is also the editor of the info section of the Bihar issue of RAS. This symposium, as I already stated, is based on the articles from this issue. And it is only appropriate and, of course, a privilege to have Professor Harris chair the session. Uh, we are fortunate to have veteran scholars and observers of the Bihar countryside as discussions for this symposium. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Chirashri Das Gupta, Associate Professor at the Center for the Study of Law and Governance, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Dr. Jerry Rogers, a uh, visiting professor at the Institute for Human Development, New Delhi, and Dr. Pravin Jha, professor at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University, to be our discussions for today. Uh, I now hand it over to the chair to conduct the proceedings. Over to you, Professor Harris. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sudan. I, I hope I, I'm heard clearly uh, by everyone. Yep. You are, Professor. Okay, so I, I just start with a little bit more of an introduction, if I may, to our, our speakers. Uh, our speakers today, oh damn it, I'm so sorry, throw my phone away. Um, to our speakers today, uh, first, if I may introduce uh, Dr. Chirashri Dasgupta, who, as has been said, is an associate professor in the Center for Study of Law and Governance at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Dr. Dasgupta writes on the political economy uh, of institutions, on economic history, the history of economic thought is the author, for example, of a book published by Cambridge University Press on state and capital in independent India, institutions and accumulation. And uh, with particular uh, relevance for our discussion today, uh, Dr. Dasgupta uh, worked as an economist at the Asia Development Research Institute uh, in Patna uh, for a, a good many years. Secondly, I'd like to introduce uh, 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 Professor Praveen uh, Jha, Professor in the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at, at JNU. Uh, Professor Jha has had, uh, I think, a very distinguished uh, career, um, being a visiting professor in a number of universities, having served on a number uh, of uh, official uh, committees. 
It's also been very active uh, in a South-South network on agrarian questions and is one of the founding editors uh, of the journal Agrarian South, a uh, journal of political economy, which you know, I really sort of commend as it's offering a, a rather different perspective uh, on uh, agrarian uh, matters of agrarian, uh, agrarian relations and agrarian change uh, than some of the other journals in the, in the field. Um, uh, Praveen is also uh, one of the uh, editors uh, with Jerry Rogers and Himanshu uh, of the book, The Changing Village in India, Insights from Longitudinal Research, which was published, I think, uh, in 2016. Our third speaker uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Rogers, who I think might be described as the doyen of agrarian studies in Bihar, having first undertaken a field work in rural Bihar, <laughs> sorry about this, Jerry, more than 50 years ago. Um, and he's the architect also, I think, one of the architects of a remarkable set of longitudinal studies in 36 uh, Bihar villages where uh, studies were conducted in the early 1980s, the late 1990s, and most recently in 2009-10. Um, and Dr. Rogers has uh, served, served for 36 years uh, with the International Labour Organization, where he held uh, many roles, including that of the director of the International Institute of uh, Labour Studies. And after retirement, has uh, served as visiting professor uh, at the Institute of Human Development uh, in, uh, in Delhi. And he was, of course, as will be known to many of you coming in today, uh, recently uh, the president of the Indian Society of Labour Economics. If I may, in the few minutes that I have, just perhaps say a little bit um, by way of introduction uh, to uh, the Pari studies uh, in, uh, in Bihar, uh, drawing on the little piece that I wrote for the In Focus uh, set of, of studies from the Pari village studies in, uh, in, in Bihar. In my introduction, I uh, reviewed work by uh, the late uh, Arvind Narayan Das and Stephen Henningham, uh, by the anthropologist uh, Anand Chakravati, uh, who wrote uh, what I think is probably the finest uh, village study from Bihar with an orientation towards agrarian uh, political economy. It's a study based on um, intensive ethnographic fieldwork in a village uh, in Purnia district and work by uh, Pradhan Prasad and following him uh, by Jerry Rogers, Alak Sharma uh, and, uh, and others. These various studies uh, show, I believe, uh, that in the later 20th century, the principal class contradiction in rural Bihar uh, was that between Maliks, or rich peasants and small landlords, and a vast underclass, as Anand Chakravarti described it, of landless laborers uh, and poor peasants. Or what I think more recently Henry Bernstein uh, has referred to under the uh, conceptual category of, uh, of classes of labor. These classes of labor uh, make up, I think, two thirds or more uh, of the rural population uh, of, uh, of Bihar. And probably rather less than 20% um, of the rural population uh, is actually constituted by uh, households that I think hit uh, the conventional understanding uh, of the category of, uh, of, of peasant. And while the agrarian economy uh, of, uh, of the state may have been accurately uh, analyzed by Pradhan Prasad in the mid 20th century in terms of the concept of semi-feudalism characterized by uh, the two modes of appropriation, uh, sharecropping and uh, usury together with extensive employment uh, of attached, usually uh, bonded labor. According to the studies by Jerry Rogers and his colleagues, these conditions 
uh, had changed quite significantly before the end of the, of the century. Rogers and his co-authors say, I quote, overall, we can see both continuity and change. The end of semi-feudal relations did not have a, notably, a noticeably adverse impact at the top of the village hierarchy, as new non-agricultural opportunities, largely outside the village, provided an economic uh, alternative for, for previously dominant groups. Agricultural labor households also had access to non-agricultural occupations uh, through migration, though few abandoned agricultural work altogether. So according to Jerry Rogers and his colleagues, the big story of agrarian change, of change in agrarian relations uh, in Bihar, as perhaps in most of India, has to do with migration outside the villages for work and sometimes for investment outside agriculture. Almost all may have benefited, but returns from migration and returning outside the village are much greater for the erstwhile Maliks um, than for, for others. Still, uh, in the findings of Rogers and uh, co-authors, the relations of dependence between the underclass and the Maliks uh, have weakened. The, the Pari studies conducted by the Foundation uh, for uh, Agrarian Studies broadly confirm, I think, these, uh, these findings, uh, notably, of course, about the significance of migration uh, from the villages, along with the sharp distinction between the upper class and the underclass of classes of, of labor. But I think there are you know, quite significant differences, which I hope we'll be teasing out a bit uh, in the course of, uh, of our discussion uh, today. Um, first, I think the Pari studies show uh, the continuing significance uh, greater significance of tenancy, including sharecropping, uh, in the two villages than I think was the case uh, in the villages studied by Rogers and uh, his colleagues. And I should say that those 36 villages uh, were selected to be representative of the diverse uh, conditions of the agrarian economy across the, uh, across the state of, of Bihar. So, uh, Perhaps some, I think we perhaps will want to talk a little bit about the continuing significance of tenancy, as I say, including sharecropping. But also, and this is perhaps especially significant, um, the evidence in the Pari studies are of uh, continuing dependency uh, with uh, uh, labor attachment still uh, being uh, extensive. And I thought it myself that it was uh, interesting and, and very significant um, that the, the authors of the Pari studies refer, for example, to the fact that they found relations between uh, landlords and manual workers still being talked of in terms of the relationships of, of Raja and, uh, and Praya. So, uh, uh, many similarities between the findings of, of other studies and the Pari studies, but, uh, but also, uh, also differences. Uh, but I think enough from, uh, from me. I'm going to turn first uh, to uh, Professor Praveen Jha, and then secondly uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Chira Sridas Gupta, uh, and uh, let um, uh, Jerry Rogers uh, come, in, uh, come in last. Um, uh, each of them, each of them will speak for 10, 15 minutes. Um, that will leave time for response by some of the authors of the, the Pari studies uh, before we, are, we open up uh, to questions from other participants. And if you, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Sudan said this, if you could uh, enter your questions, those of you who are 
following uh, the, uh, the session uh, by Zoom. If you could enter your questions into the chat box, that would be, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, so Praveen, over, over to you. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to be part of this conversation and hence grateful to Parvati and all the colleagues at FAS for facilitating this. Bihar, of course, is my home state. It's a state on which I have focused uh, a good deal in terms of field studies and uh, in many other ways. Uh, and hence, it gives me additional pleasure that you have brought me back to Bihar in this conversation. Okay, so let me just begin with the, the papers in the focus section. I think all the contributions are very, very substantive. These are fine-grained accounts engaging with a whole range of issues, both empirically and analytically, as the chair suggested, in terms of stories of continuity and change and both analytically and what is happening currently in terms of details, et cetera. Now, obviously the brief remarks that I make here can hardly do justice to the very, very rich canvas. What I propose to do is to confine my intervention to flagging a couple of issues which possibly go a little beyond just to engage the authors in, um, let's say, with these accounts a little more. So the first point I'm saying that these contributions are indeed very, very substantive, very convincing, deeply satisfying for me who has been looking at Bihar at least a little bit. Right? But beyond that, what are the other issues which the authors could uh, talk about, reflect on, etc. So just a couple of issues there, not uh, a long laundry list, just some important kind of uh, concerns which uh, 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 seem very important to me. Uh, of course, the chair has given a very brief account of the terrain that the papers have covered. Yeah. But that, of course, is indeed brief. Um, it is a pleasure for me to follow in the footstep of uh, Professor Harris in taking this conversation forward. Now, the first issue, you know, um, this whole issue of mode of production debate in agriculture, around which a lot of discussion has happened in Bihar and you know, during 1960s, starting late 1950s, 60s, 70s, etc., uh, it raised a whole range of extremely important issues, insights, findings, etc. However, my sense of it, even as a student, when this debate was going on, was that it's a bit of a trap. You know, um, sort of. Firstly. Can we really talk about sort of modes of production in a sectoral sense in agriculture? Where does it come from? What kind of legitimacy does it have and so on and so forth? Yeah. Are we looking at whole set of connections with the rest of the economy to inform our understanding and judgment about this whole mode of production issue? So there were all these issues, which I sort of was um, a bit um, uneasy about, e even when I was doing my PhD and so on. And uh, uh, I thought that uh, it needed to conceptually and otherwise engage with uh, many other issues if we are using this idea of motor production. Right? Of course, we also know that during that debate, I think uh, uh, there was a view which seemed to have, by the time we came towards the end of this debate, and after that it kind of fizzles out, yeah, which enjoyed an upper hand, sort of slow, gradual uh, march of capitalism 
in uh, Indian agriculture and so on, a lot of discussion about what criteria should we focus on, etc. Right? Which brings me to the second issue that uh, this feudal, semi-feudal and that sort of characterization. Again, uh, even as I was barely 10 year old or so when uh, uh, in early 70s, looking at uh, the developments which were happening in my village and the villages around me and so on. Uh, and later, when I was looking at uh, uh, some of the characterizations, again, I found it very unsatisfactory. Whether Pradhan Prasad, whether Bhaduri, you know, it, it actually seemed like you know, a trap in terms of understanding what is happening. I, I could see many people who were interested in investing in agriculture, right? Not only sort of those who are classified as rich peasants or uh, middle peasants, but even, you know, some of the so-called landlords, yes. So again, my own perception looking at the ground then, and of course, subsequently when I started, uh, I, I did my PhD actually on Bihar. It was agricultural labor in Bihar and uh, so, I studied a few villages, uh, mostly in Purnia, but also I went to Katihar and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, a couple of other neighboring places, Madhepura, etc. Basically, uh, it was in about five, six districts that I was uh, trying to make sense of the changes and so on. So, yes, even though this discussion and debate was indeed rich then. Yeah, so you have very important issues for our consideration, but analytically, as, as I said, I, I was always very uneasy with it, the framing of many things and so on. So do we want to remain in the same kind of um, uh, framing when we are thinking about what is happening in Bihar today, what has happened during the last 50 years or so? Uh, I, it would be good to maybe reflect a little more on these issues. Right? As I said, that you know, in 1970s we already have you know, uh, several contributors who are uh, who the chair did not really kind of mention, but throwing up a variety of issues which take us some distance away from what was being discussed in this conversation. Yeah. So that is uh, the second point I wanted to make. As regards uh, the brief paragraph that you quoted from uh, uh, Professor Rogers and his co-authors, yeah, continuity and change and you know, that particular study. Sure, it's sort of the, what is continuing and what is changing on those, I think uh, uh, Jerry's work along with his co-authors is immensely important. Uh, and uh, all of us benefited a great deal and have been benefiting from those studies a great deal. Right? However, you know, there is already a history of many of the things which are flagged there and as it happens also being flagged in uh, our Paris studies for Bihar, uh, that we need to take note of. For instance, you know, th this phrase that was used by K. Balgopal, you know, talking of what he called the triple elite, right? And this triple elite phenomena, yeah, of course, you are, you are, you are dominant in Bihar, you know, in the, in, the, in the countryside, in agriculture, etc., in your own village, but Right since 1950s, the kind of access you have to, in particular, public sector jobs, because there was very little of private sector then. Yeah. And indeed, you know, all kinds of businesses. This is what uh, Balgopal had captured in terms of uh, uh, this idea, this notion, this concept called triple elite. Now, this was there when I was born. Yeah. <laughs> and what is happening and how are we kind of... Uh, uh, taking note of that and so on. And how did that influence the agricultural dynamics in the state? Yeah, of course, subsequently, these became far more pronounced, 
far more uh, heightened, etc., which we uh, need to uh, take note of. So, what we find from 70s, subsequently in the 80s, yeah, this what what late Arvind Das had described as uh, voting by feet, uh, as regards the underclass, uh, that was picking up on a significant scale compared to 70s, 80s, and that of course has become one of the most important phenomena for. Uh, the Bihar Society. Yeah. Uh, some of you will recall that uh, very good film uh, by Prakash Shah called Damun, when these agricultural laborers, you know, workers just want to leave the village and they are shot dead. And the kind of tyranny that we had, and compared to that, of course, the situation in the 90s and subsequently has. So Arvind had called it, uh, you know, voting by feet in uh, Bihar Society at that point in time. As it happens, very soon after that, we also have voting by feet by some of the important segments of the dominant classes. You know, basically, there is you know, what Valgopal had identified as triple elite. Now you see that they actually shift their base. Uh, Jerry is uh, one of the kind of, uh, he, he, he likes Purnia quite a lot. Once upon a time, he actually wanted to build a house in Purnia and live there. <laughs> right? I'm not kidding. You know? But, uh, you know, if you look at the land prices in Purnia, the way it zoomed during the last couple of decades, almost everybody, whoever can afford it, even a very, very tiny plot of land there. Yeah. Now, this is not only about landlords. This is not only about rich peasants, but also those down the ladder, obviously, if they can afford it. Right? So this partial exit, how has this impacted on the agricultural dynamics? Subsequently, along with the neoliberal assault on Indian agriculture, how does then that start changing the dynamics? So if our authors could have reflected a little more on some of these things in their villages, of course, what I'm saying is based on some 5, 10, 15 villages that I have known reasonably well. Yeah? And I have been revisiting some of these over the years, etc. Now, this has had very, very important implications, of course, along many axes, you know, uh, ag agrarian systems, how they are changing and so on and so forth, shifts in cropping patterns, which is being talked about, I think, Niladri's paper, was, you know, this horticulture, etc., and the importance of that, yeah? how this impacts on uh, the whole axis of inequality, etc. Madhura and Shruti have uh, done a wonderful job in uh, uh, talking about those issues. So many of these issues are flagged here. What I am uh, asking us is to reflect a little more, maybe, if uh, uh, that uh, can be incorporated in our understanding and so on. The issues of labor absorption, as it happens, that could have found a little more attention in um, these papers. You know, uh, sort of mechanization, economic reforms, you know, all kinds of things which have happened. Uh, so overall sort of trends relating to labor absorption, what is happening to the male versus female kind of distribution there? Some of these things have been talked about. Some people actually often use this expression, which is problematic from my point of view, feminization of agriculture. Uh, but um, yes, I mean, that. So these are a whole lot of issues, apart from mechanization, you have whole practices that uh, have come up, we decide and so on and so forth, and what does that do to labor absorption? So if some of these uh, could have been flagged, uh, I, I, I'll take maybe two more minutes, Chair, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, um, of course, from the political kind of uh, dynamics since late 80s, early 90s, and the churning that, that we see. You know, that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the churning at the lower rungs and the changing social and political and economic dynamics, uh, loosening of social and economic controls that uh, you have talked about, how we could have woven some of that in our stories yeah, of uh, what is happening in these villages, etc. Uh, because the social, the political, and so on uh, has been uh, reconfigured very dramatically since 
this whole mandal politics and uh, mobilization around that, etc. Uh, and it is continuously getting reconfigured. It's not the case that it has reached a dead end. Right? So that landscape, that politics, how to weave that in some of these uh, conversations can be of uh, uh, issues of gender. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, I, very briefly, this whole feminization of agriculture vis-a-vis -vis labor, but I think, uh, uh, can, is there enough information in these Paris studies to say a little more? I think uh, many quantitative, qualitative issues can be probably teased out. I mean, I have not looked at the data firsthand, but I'm sure, I mean, with the, someone like Madhura and all the other colleagues there who have been working on that data, my sense is that there could be probably a little more on that. The paper on education, uh, of course, you know, the importance of RT has to be taken note of. But well before that, midday meal schemes, especially the dry rations, you know, that is when there was a very significant increase in enrollment. And I'm talking of mid 90s, right? I, I had seen it myself across all the villages. They would take the ration. Subsequently, it became cooked food. But you know, for that reason, now <laughs> enrollment was there, but was there education? So that is that is a very important question that we need to uh, uh, sort of keep on focus. What I have seen in many of these villages, the villages that I am talking about, there is a massive, massive expansion of private tutors. Mm -hmm. Right, cross villages I know, and then in almost every second village that I go to, there is a W English medium public school, Papu English medium public school, many other such English medium public schools in a small little hut in a shack, yeah, and <laughs> you know this whole business of registering there if you get some food etc. But what is happening here, the quality issues etc. Uh, I think uh, probably we could think a little more about that if uh, indeed we have data on these issues. Last two points here. One, you know, uh, recently there is so much discussion across the world about so-called supply chains and commodity chains and so on. How is Bihar agriculture getting incorporated in that? Now, uh, let me also put it uh, up front that I actually don't like these phrases, supply chains, commodity chains, and so on. In fact, my own uh, uh, preferred phrase along with Paris Yoros and late Sam Moyo has been contemporary global agricultural value systems. I, we, we use that precisely because we think that the imminent tendencies and the systemic kind of uh, forces at work do get drawn into the discussion uh, by using that, otherwise we kind of get trapped again in some very simple metaphors and you know superficial ways of talking about these things. So that's one, because one of my, uh, you know, re recently a couple of my students have done PhDs on Bihar and Punjab and have done the comparative thing. So it's not only in things like horticulture, but also in cereals. In patty, for instance, you know, this whole sort of very significant uh, change in how these villages are getting reconfigured, et cetera, in the global agricultural system. Now, do we have something here on which we can say something? And very, very last point. Sorry if I have taken more time. You know, uh, the chair started with the uh, sort of uh, the whole uh, discussion on agrarian questions and so on. Now, I think what we observe in all these villages, all these studies, many other studies, etc., has a, a great deal to debunk a certain notion of, you know, certain kind of discourse, certain kind of framing of agrarian questions, which was connected with, driven by industrialization discourse, right? Now, this is something on which uh, me and my colleagues, uh, again, Paris, Sam, etc., we sort of have been doing work for the last decade and a half. And uh, I think I would be very happy to see some uh, explicit kind of uh, conversation on how do the findings from these Pari villages connect with the debates on agrarian questions, both in classical uh, and Maxian political economy, uh, as it happens. No, uh, I think uh, 
Henry, Henry Bernstein, Professor Henry Bernstein feels very, very unhappy with the way we have uh, questioned their discourse. So let me leave, leave it at that. That's, that's Thank a you. good point at which to, at which to finish. Uh, uh, pro <laughs> yeah, a, a, a reference to the very important differences of, of view, I think, between uh, you and your colleagues and uh, and somebody like uh, like Henry Bernstein. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope we can come back to some of uh, some of the, the these the points that you have raised. Thank you. Uh, next up, please, uh, uh, Dr. Chilashri uh, Dasgupta. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Harris. I hope I'm audible. Yep. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm grateful to the Foundation of Agrarian Studies uh, for inviting me uh, to this panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to see Jerry even though online after many, many years. And uh, uh, Praveen, of course, I get to see uh, sometimes in JNU and uh, getting to meet Professor Harris uh, on a panel after having heard him and read him all through my years as a student and even now is like <laughs> really enriching. And uh, I suspect Avnish has something to do with my being on this panel. Uh, and so I am grateful to him as well. Uh, so uh, I would like to start with a slightly different canvas in the sense of uh, being more focused on Bihar uh, in terms of the timing of the study, which is, uh, the bigger survey takes place in 2011-12, and most of the papers are written around that time, which is the uh, just after the second NDA uh, government under Nitish Kumar comes to power in Bihar. And if you look at the um, first NDA government and uh, the claim with which it came to power, and I'll just highlight a few. Uh, things. Uh, the first is, of course, what we know as Sushasan, the good governance agenda uh, of development, and which was claimed to have uprooted caste politics from Bihar. This was the first claim. The second was uh, a series of, like, uh, in keeping with the traditional uh, Washington consensus, good governance agenda, even though the rest of the world was moving on to the post-Washington consensus. There was this uh, large neoliberal package of reforms which were uh, introduced into agriculture. And this started with the abolition of APMCs. And then there was uh, uh, the introduction of Kisan credit cards as a, uh, that was their solution to sort of uh, the addressing the problem of non-institutional credit formation of seed banks and uh, uh, distribution of uh, subsidized diesel sets. And later in the second, uh, uh, under the second NDA government was the procurement for PDS through the PACs. Now, uh, this is at a time when there is this claim of a huge growth spurt in Bihar, which is uh, uh, mentioned in the paper by Swaminathan and Nagarjun, but uh, uh, if you look closely at the data, uh, especially on agricultural growth, uh, there are two inconsistencies which were pointed out then itself in a series of uh, papers. One was written by me, there were several by others. The first was uh, including Nagraj. Okay, the first was that uh, this claim of 33% agricultural growth in 2007 and 15 to 20% growth for a period of more than 10 years. And uh, this was not reflected if you then looked at the government's own data on yield and production crop wise. And what you found was that both yield and production in rice, wheat uh, and uh, maize, which was supposed to be the wonder crop at that time in Bihar, were, had all fallen very, very drastically in both these periods, which is the period of, from 2001 to 2008 and 2008 to 2015. Now it is in this backdrop then that, and if you look at the period 2011-12 to 
day. Uh, what you find is that out of the total claimed growth, even if we take it at face value, okay, without going into the problems with numbers, etc., which are there anyway, what you find is that agriculture just accounts for 10%, like uh, less than 8% of the uh, total uh, agriculture and livestock together, 9.5%. And the primary sector, which includes mining and fishing, and quarrying uh, is about 10%, accounts for 10% of the growth. Actually, Bihar's growth, whatever it is, 90% is in the tertiary sector. And just 9% is in the secondary sector. So in terms of the uh, composition of the state domestic product, this is where agriculture stands in terms of its uh, importance and that would have a connect in some ways with what was being surveyed in these two villages uh, in this period. And so while one really appreciates the first study in which we see the high level of uh, caste class correspondence, which is not surprising, but also the interlocking of land, labor and credit that is pointed out, which then raises one question, which is that on one hand, uh, even for, from, uh, in these studies, uh, there is not much uh, reflection on unfreedom, except on the uh, paper on homestead land. But at the same time, if land, labor and credit are tied closely, which we get from the quantitative data, what we need to really, uh, like, which triggers two questions, one is then how much does, is this related to intergenerational bondage of the old kind that we knew of? And the second is that like how far has institutional credit penetrated the villages? Now, uh, the second set of questions, uh, the second set of observations that come from these studies are uh, in terms of uh, uh, like the, Tom, the power of the political, the correspondence of political and economic power, which Praveen uh, was also referring to, has been actually captured in terms of uh, uh, saying that uh, the dominant uh, classes actually control not only the various institutions like the PACs, the VOs, and the panchayats, but also control the setting of wages. Uh, so in that sense, how is this once again? And at the same time, there is, there is correspondence with the study by Rogers and Rogers and others, where there is this observation of uh, uh, correspondence in terms of both proletarianization and pauperization. So in this, I think one of the important questions to bring in, uh, which is a question that goes back to earlier debates and which would then again make the, uh, you know, from Pradhan Prashad to Chakravarti, the debates that we've seen relevant is the credit labor linkage. Which is, mm -hmm. And this is one part that is like, I think that could be elaborated from the data that's already there. Uh, the study on inequality and wealth is extremely revealing. And it, uh, and it also uh, kind of reveals the limits of the All India Debt and Investment Survey uh, in how much it underestimates inequality. And uh, uh, especially like what is happening to the bottom deciles and that particular observation that if you look if you take out food inventory, the poorest household's asset was worth just rupees 900. Uh, and uh, that's like incredibly significant at a time when the claim is also officially that there has been a very large amount of poverty reduction in Bihar uh, in the uh, last uh, decade and a half. However, this is something that not even the uh, state government in Bihar has ever actually owned up to. They've never, they've claimed many things, but they've never claimed that they've reduced poverty. In fact, Mr. Nitish Kumar has always insisted that 95% uh, of Bihar is poor. 
and he has insisted on multi looking at poverty multidimensionally. Okay. So, but the official figures that emanate from the union government and various kinds of like estimates and the debates around the poverty line, uh, this kind of asset index actually helps some ways into making a different kind of intervention, not only about rising inequality, but also in some ways uh, of uh, uh, the asset poverty levels, okay, the poverty of assets. The, the, la the last point specifically about the studies uh, that, that I want to make is that uh, the, it is interesting to see the caste pattern of land mortgages, which has been uh, uh, pointed out quite well in uh, Avnish's study on land and caste relations. There is uh, there's also the, the difference between the census and the party surveys and the uh, a huge land concentration of nine, like for example, in uh, Nayanagar, ninety-eight percent of the land is owned by twenty-five percent population of Punyas, and uh, on the other hand, what we see is ninety-two percent OBCs, scheduled uh, um, castes are landless, and eighty-six percent OBCs. However, uh, this uh, and uh, at the same time, the point about OBC assertion since the mid 1990s is also made in the paper. Now, there is something that I want to bring in here, which is that uh, this we have done some field work also in like adjoining districts, Vaishali, etc., North Central. Okay? And one of the things, and this is something that Praveen also mentioned uh, 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 and highlighted, which is that. One of the other aspects that we see in shifting land holdings is that many people who are landed in, uh, uh, we found this in Vaishali, we found this in Darbhanga, we found this even uh, in the uh, peripheral uh, areas of Patna, that uh, people who held, let us say, uh, land in more uh, uh, remote areas were selling their land uh, at uh, and then buying land which is uh, sort of closer to hubs of trade etc and this was purely for the sake of investment in real estate so slowly there is a shift of investment from land that is for agricultural use to land that is for real estate and this corresponds with what you see is the investment in the largest single component driving Bihar's growth in the last two decades is trade, hotels, restaurants, and real estate. So this is something that I think is important in terms of looking at uh, the uh, land, uh, the, the kind of shifting investment in land in the last uh, uh, decade or so. And then there is, of course, the study on uh, 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 edu education and attendance, and uh, if you see that there is more differentiated uh, impact on men, but on women you find, uh, like except for the highest, uh, like at the education at the highest level, there's not much impact on the kind of labor that they do. However, as Praveen pointed out, you know, enrollment ratios are very misleading in Bihar. We have a study, uh, we've done edu uh, an extensive study uh, with the IGC uh, on uh, educate the school education system in Bihar. And what we found is that the dropout rates are very, very high. Uh, to just give you an example that for uh, all of Bihar, uh, if you take the total enrollment at the uh, uh, primary level, just 3% of students who are enrolled at the primary level make it to the uh, uh, high, uh, secondary and post uh, high secondary levels. So there's almost a 90 to 95% dropout rate. That's a 90 to 95% dropout rate over 10 years. So it is important to go beyond the enrollment and uh, look at some of the things that Praveen has already said, so I don't want to repeat that. I just move on to the last part to raise some 
La it's last just, point, I think, uh, Chirashiki. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the first is uh, like uh, the question of uh, uh, treatment of labor in terms of, on one hand, there is the classification of landlord and capitalist farmer, which is like landlord stroke capitalist farmer. And what is really that differentiates the two? And by, on the other hand, there is a kind of broad classification of labor, but there isn't really a, uh, uh, a, a recognition here in terms of the graded hierarchy of labor, which is based on the graded hierarchy of caste. And this corresponds, for example, in, the, uh, in terms of also some kind of a more anthropological social uh, sort of approach where we could have had. So for example, if you look at the Musahars who are mentioned at one place, uh, the kind of labor that they are entitled to, or even within agriculture, the kind of uh, uh, hierarchy of tasks according to caste is something that also brings out a story in, term, in terms of not just labor differentiation, but also the correspondence between uh, caste and class in, uh, in a slightly uh, uh, different way in terms of caste, uh, class as a social relationship. And the question of patriarchy in the constitution of caste and class relations, which I somehow found that while there is some comparison of gender in at least two, uh, two of the studies, that this is completely missing in the framework, the design of the study. And this, I think, is important in terms of not only the conditions of employment of women or wages, but also the significance and the significance of unpaid work, but also the conditions of uh, domestic employment and the entire relationship between social reproduction and production. And with which then brings me to my final comment, which is that the whole constitution. So this, in some ways, there is a reference to intersection of caste and class. There is also then some reference to gender, but there seems to be like, and there is a high correlation established between caste and class. But to really throw the debate into the ring is to ask the question, so is caste, class, patriarchy, co-constitutive or are these intersectional? What is it that the framework is trying to say? And I think uh, while there is a rich ref list of reference that we get through these studies and especially Professor Harris's in in uh, uh, introduction, there is one very important theoriz theorization that came from the left in terms of the caste class land relationship is BT Randive 1979 EPW, which I didn't find in any of the studies. So I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we're running a little behind. Uh, so I think I'll hand over straight away to uh, Dr. Rogers. Uh, Jerry, please come in. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much to the friends of the, of the Foundation for the invitation to, to participate in, in this event, which was very nice for, for me because it uh, brought me back to, to Bihar after, after a while. Um, I haven't been working on, on Bihar recently, and it gave me the opportunity to try and start um, thinking again about some of the things that have been, that have been happening there. I think I, I should start by pointing out that the chair was very remiss in talking about Rogers and his co-authors instead of naming them, um, because uh, uh, much of the work that I have been doing in Bihar has been done jointly, well, not only with, with Janine, um, but also with, uh, of course, with Alak uh, Narayan Sharma, who was the driving force behind uh, a lot of this, this work going way back to the, the 1980s. And there's been work done with uh, Amrita Data and others. So there's a there's a group of people who've been contributing to the the development of the 
empirical work uh, on Bihar that, um, that we have been doing um, originally at the A. N. Sinner Institute in, in Patna and then later on with IHD in Delhi. So I think that's, that's quite important to, to, start, to start there. Um, I think, um, uh, like the other speakers, I, I really appreciated uh, reading these articles and, uh, uh, and seeing how the attempts to understand agrarian systems, the uh, patterns of inequality that they generate, the, the underlying forces. The, the empirical contribution of these studies um, is, um, is extremely important and all the more so important because the, the subject is, is sort of rather out, out of fashion. It's, um, th this, is, this is a minority interest and uh, uh, even if half of the population is, is still rural, the, the bulk of the attention of, uh, of academic work is, is, uh, is focused elsewhere. And yet these, these issues that are being treated in these papers are some of the most basic in issues for understanding the, the development process and the, the distribution of the gains from, from development, which... Um, so, so the Paris studies are, are, are invaluable uh, for that. And, um, and perhaps uh, especially so in, in Bihar, um, uh, I, I was used to think, perhaps I still think that um, that if you can solve Bihar problems, uh, everything else is easy, right? So, so, so trying to un understand the 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 the, the patterns of a society and how it is evolving in in rural Bihar uh, is um, is is where you can start to to develop ideas about what where 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 the key relationships are, what are the structural factors which are embedded in India's growth path and uh, and and what what can you what can you do about it? Um, so I think um, I think that that uh, as a sort of preamble is uh, I think this this um, this uh, symposium is actually uh, quite important and the work that's being done here is is quite important on behalf. But the um, the other point and, and I guess I'm echoing Praveen uh, and I think. Um, in what I say, I will will be echoing probably more because I think we're on the same wavelength. Uh, Bihar is not an island, um, and um, and the the backwardness of Bihar today, but, but even in the past where it appeared to be more of an island, um, uh, you you couldn't understand it by just looking at at Bihar alone. Um, you had to to think about how did Bihar fit into a a wider economic and, and social system, even if many of the relationships appeared to be local and specific, um, they, they were actually in many ways uh, the local realities which, contra which uh, reflected um, uh, a, wider, a wider issue. Um, so, so I think um, is the, these, these studies uh, are extremely important to help us understand village systems um, and there needs to be then a balance you need both you need to have both the the empirical studies which help you to understand um, what's happening in the village and then you need to to set that um, uh, against um, a wider understanding of, of how the village is integrated into into the wider economy and society and um, and that of course, in, in, in economic terms, you can sort of reduce that to, to flow. So you can say that there's there's capital, there's labor, and there's goods which are flowing into and out of um, the the villages. Um, the, the the studies probably focus. I mean, there's very little. To, it's very hard to to look at capital flows. The, the information on on capital flows are uh, is very 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 poor. Uh, and yet that's probably an extremely important mechanism. But on migration, much more can be said. And the, and the studies do, do look at the ways in which um, uh, migration is integrated within the way the village economy functions. Um, I think perhaps the studies, um, uh, they, they are pointed they are a point in time these are studies of a point in time and perhaps the the most important uh, effect of migration is in terms of change 
my, migration drives drives change, and in the um, um, and and in the sort of work that we have been doing in the past, um, the um, the importance of migration was was quite evident, both in creating new opportunities, in changing the relative bargaining power of of different groups within um, within the village, uh, and and in a number of ways bringing the mechanisms of the market to a system in which market forces were, were, were weak. Uh, well, one of the um, obvious consequences of migration in rural Bihar has been to put labor into a national market. Um, and there seems to me to be little doubt that it has been responsible for rising wages in many parts of Bihar. At the same time, as it has been holding wages down in areas of destination. So wage, labor wages in, in Delhi would certainly have been rising much faster or in Punjab, the destination areas of many of the migrants concerned would have been rising faster. But at the same time, there has been some influence on, on, on wages in both, both wage systems um, uh, and, and wage levels uh, within Bihar. And that's one thing that I found was more or less lacking in the studies, not, not, um, not much attention to, to the processes which generate changes in wages and changes in, in real um, living standards. Um, and I think that that could have been given um, more attention. But there's also the point which I think Ravin already made, which is that migration is not just about labor migration. This is not just casual, um, casual labor migrating to, um, uh, to building sites in Delhi, because uh, the different groups within the village all have access to the possibilities uh, of labor markets outside and the, the ways in which the elites of the village benefit from migration are just as important as the ways in which uh, agricultural labor benefits from migration. And you can, you, you, you need to try and understand what's this doing to the, to the overall, the overall uh, structure of inequality. Uh, and the answer may be, uh, the, the balance is that the structure of inequality doesn't change very much because the opportunities for the elite through education, through access to public um, sector jobs, uh, through access to um, uh, better paying employment out, out, outside the village for the second generation of, of the elite, that's probably just as important in terms of um, consolidating their economic position as, um, as are the opportunities of casual labour for agricultural workers so that the the overall impact on on the pattern of inequality within the village may not be may not be large but in terms of the way the, the village economy functions it is a, it is absolutely huge and um, it's again a feeling that the, the studies that um, are reported here acknowledge the importance of migration as in a, in a sort of static sense but but not so much in in, in terms of um, of its uh, dynamics. Um, I, I think the, well, I, I, I could, uh, both Jirashri and, and Pravin talked about, about gender. And I think um, that's, um, so that, that's, that point has been clearly made. In, in the work which we did in the past, we tried to in, embed the issue of gender and and labor um, within our structural model and in particular the, the differentiation of the peasantry the model of the differentiation of the peasantry which we which we used in in some of our work in the past um, uh, i i should say as a preamble that we we differentiated in terms of relationships with labor in, in the studies that have been um, included in this volume is that uh, the peasantry tends to be differentiated in terms of the value of their assets. That's, that's also obviously an important issue. But I think structurally in terms of the relationship with the economic system, labor is, is a more compelling way of looking at how the, the peasantry divides. And um, we had one important division of the peasantry was 
whether or not the um, women were working, uh, were undertaking work in agriculture. And, um, and the, the, the large peasants, and it coincided largely with, of course, caste categories, um, were those in which men might be working or supervising um, work on, on the land, but women were not. And, um, and this actually proved to be a rather important dividing line in the way in which, um, um, in the way in which uh, uh, class relationships could be, could be identified. Um, I mean, gen gen gender issues are there th throughout, and and it clearly is um, a, a weakness of the of the studies in this this issue that they that they are not given given more more attention. Uh, it doesn't have to be the, the way the way we did it, but um, but but the gender relations need to be in, embedded in the concept of of class and not uh, considered to be some sort of an, an add-on. Now, of course, the gender issues is not just, a, it's a class issue and it's a caste issue. And um, one of the- um, Class issue, the, caste issue? Or it's, a, it's not just a class issue, but it's a caste issue. Yeah. So it's, it's actually part of this sort of, we, we struggled and I can, can see that um, everybody struggled with this, uh, this issue. Of, caste and class and the and the dominant forces and the, the, the pattern of the relationships and, and to what extent these these are um, uh, independent constitutive forces or, or, or how in how the pattern of class differentiation is in fact simply a reflection of the um, perpetuation of, 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 of caste differentiation uh, and I I thought that um, the um, I mean, where we came in, in the end, we, we, we simply um, saw caste as a, as a mechanism which the legitimation of a social hierarchy from caste um, uh, reinforces the class differences and perpetuates them. Um, uh, there's much more that could be said, said on that, but I think it's, it's also true that I think Shirashi made the point that more could have been, more, more could have been made of that in the, in the studies. But but also there are signs of change. Sorry, and that man, you've come in. Uh, it's my fault. I've uh, not kept uh, everybody to time well enough. I think we need to wrap up in just a minute or so. Okay. Well, then let me not uh, go any further except just make one point. Things are changing, and in, some, in at least one village where we have seen that the legitimation of the social hierarchy in, embedded in caste has has been um, uh, questioned, especially by young people. And I was going to say that there's a gender issue, but there's also an age issue. And there's a yeah. new generation in the villages which actually doesn't see things in the same way and doesn't actually accept the same, the same sort of uh, caste hierarchy that there was in the past. And that could be regarded as an element of class conflict, but it can also be the, the beginnings of an undermining of some of the, of the embedded structures. I wanted to say one more thing, which I think is also quite important, which is um, there, there's a large Muslim population in, in Bihar, and, and you can say that like, there are villages which are dominated by Muslims. There are villages with a large Muslim minority, and there are, Muslim, there are villages with, with none. And you have one in each of the two latter categories here. But what we have seen in the past is that the, the class mechanisms within the Muslim community are different. And although it might not be politically correct to be uh, uh, saying positive things about, um, about Muslim communities, but um, the 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 idea that we started to get, it hasn't been tested systematically, but it, it seems that the degree of solidarity within Muslim communities is greater um, than within Hindu communities. And that's clearly, um, that, 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 that's clear in, in villages which are Muslim dominated, but it's also clear within villages where there's a large Muslim minority. And I think this is an issue which is completely passed over. There's just one table which sort of says there are some Muslims, but there's no, there's no um, uh, attempt to, to understand whether the, the caste differentiations which um, are being discussed also have a, um, operate in a different way in, in, in Muslim communities. I think that's, there, there seems to be, there are signs, there's more distribution, more redistribution and less exploitative relations in, in that, um, in, in, in Muslim communities.
So, I mean, m many more things that could be said. Uh, just l let me make just one more point, John, which is um, right. uh, a, small, a, small, a small comment on the, on the question of wealth distribution. Um, you know, what about the mobile phone and the communication with the outside, which, um, again, the mobile phone may, may not be so much. And the, the, this is a study in 2012, but even in 2012, the mobile phone was there, smartphones were starting to spread. And um, that's more and more today. And um, it seems that uh, the, the, the ownership of, of means of communication is becoming more and more important as a, as a source of change. And that, that, that in today's agrarian system, that, that needs to be addressed because the distribution of those goods across the, the population may not be, it may be quite widespread, may not be homogenous. The use which is being made by different groups is, is, is different. So I thought that that was, um, that was something which merited um, so, some attention. Anyway, this is a very valuable set of articles and I learned a great deal from, from reading them and congratulations to all of the authors. I'd like to thank uh, all three uh, commentators on the, uh, on the papers. Um, uh, all are saying that the, that the, the, stud the studies in the in focus section of the review of agrarian studies are very rich, that there are uh, uh, many, a number of very significant questions that are, are not uh, are not elaborated upon in the uh, in in the papers. Of course, one can only do so much uh, in, uh, in in a paper, uh, and I think you know there's a there's an awful lot of material in the Pari studies uh, which merit really further further analysis. Uh, I apologize for not having been a sufficiently draconian chair and to have uh, allowed uh, the time to pass by rather too quickly. Let me now turn uh, to the, the authors of, of the studies uh, for a response. Um, we haven't discussed uh, an order of, uh, uh, of response, but perhaps I could ask uh, Niladri first, uh, if you have um, a, a response, then I would ask uh, Avanish and uh, uh, and then uh, 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 Madhura, if that's uh, if that's all right. Uh, okay, uh, Niladri, have you any points that you or points that you'd like to make uh, in response to uh, the comments that have uh, you've uh, listened to? Are you there? No. Nope. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, Nilantri. Hi, hi <coughs> come on, come on. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, useful discussion on the papers because you know now I can, we can uh, see that Sorry, there are yeah. so many things we put up. <laughs> so many things we could have done on these papers. So uh, thank you all the panelists for, the, uh, for your, uh, for your uh, suggestions and comments. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, this, all the speakers actually talks about the, the you, know, uh, you know, how we have treated labor. Uh, you know, uh, in the in this in the in the, in the uh, special in class chapter. So, uh, labor. Uh, see here, we have taken uh, we have used labor as simply as a classificated identification uh, uh, criteria. Okay, here we have uh, labor is not a, in a discussed in detail. The uh, the as Praveen. Uh, uh, Professor Pravinja mentioned about male female labor, feminization of agriculture. Those things are not addressed in this paper. Labor here, we have uh, tried to understand in terms of identifying the classes and how these classes are, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, located in a specific production system. So, this is the first comment I want to make. Second is about the, Dr. Chirush mentioned about the, how we distinguished between landlord and capitalist farmer. So now landlord, uh, 
the definition of landlord is straightforward. They are historically the dominant households in the village, both socially, politically, and economically. But for the capitalist farmer, the, the, the differentiating point with the landlord is the they actually emerge from the richer, richer class of peasantry, and they actually uh, start characterizing themselves as you know, they adopt the characteristics, some of the characteristics of the landlord, like they don't participate in the, uh, in any labor process, they don't, uh, their family members does not participate in any uh, farming activities. So uh, basically, this is the, you know, uh, differentiating point, uh, capitalist farmers, they have upward mobility from rich, uh, uh, richer section of the peasantry, upper middle peasantry, they become a class, but they don't. Uh, they uh, follow certain characteristics which landlords, uh, landlords uh, do. You know, historically, uh, uh, they follow. Uh, so, uh, about uh, now, here we have not as Praveen, uh, Praveen has mentioned. Uh, we have not seen we, we 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 have not addressed anything related to you know uh, uh, how Bihar agriculture is integrated in global value chain and uh, this kind of uh, this uh, this uh, this a broader issue like this. So these papers are about the village economies in village economies how this the different uh, 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 individuals take part in the production process and how where they situated in the class configuration that's what we have tried in this paper and about migration uh, bihar uh, uh, a migration is uh, one of the important issue and here we have tried to address the migration issue uh, in the class identification in uh, Bit different way in both the villages, Katkuya and Nayanagar, where uh, we have actually considered the migrant as a uh, as a you know, household member, uh, where they sent their remittances as well as they have uh, uh, participated in the uh, all the economic and social processes within the village. So these few things I wanted to mention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nilaji. Uh, Avanish, uh, would you like to come in now, please? Hi. Uh, I Hello. don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm audible. Yeah. Okay. I hear you very well. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, the chair, Professor Harris, and all the discussants, and uh, for very, very useful uh, comments and suggestions and criticisms of our papers. I can see that I have filled three full pages. Uh, taking notes uh, uh, i would just for the interest of time i think i will just take two uh, of them uh, i which i felt uh, spoke to my paper uh, my papers two of the contributions um, first is the question of uh, which i think professor jha and uh, dr das gupta both of them pointed out about in a way they pointed out about categories and nomenclatures and both in their uh, the empirical content and also in terms of their analytical value so you know for example if you use usage of the terms like landlords capitalist farmers or, or things like that now this is really has been a problem uh, uh, professor harris uh, who who worked with us through these papers is aware of it uh, uh, that where and how to use these categories and do they really you know if we use the term called landlords in the 70s does it really mean the same thing even now you know by calling the same uh, different set of people by the same name and this is also important i feel because uh, uh, this was not the intent of the studies but somehow it it so happened that these two villages were very different from each other in their histories in their uh, sociological uh, constitution so uh, I, I i i don't have an answer i i think i'm just engaging with the point being made is that is it would it be fair to then uh, characterize the old classical kind of dominance that the bhumihars have in nayanagar with the uh, kind of dominance that the new 
uh, Yadav uh, 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 land owning classes have in Katkuya. Uh, can we label both of them with this category called uh, landlords or even capitalist farmers? What is their approach to labor? What is their approach to work? What is their approach to uh, many other things? This is something that I think a more uh, a sociological anthropological study uh, will be able to answer. I must confess, uh, uh, in fact, I should have be, I should have started by confessing that this is a limitation. Many of the criticisms uh, is also a, a problem because uh, uh, the the research design of village surveys uh, as a methodology has uh, certain limitations, and because of which many of these questions uh, have been inadequately addressed in the study itself and the data that comes out of it and because of which I think we have not been able to engage with many other issues. Uh, and the second thing I want to say is about um, the entire question of uh, uh, um, the two villages and the impact of the last 30 years of uh, socio-political change, especially with the rise of uh, uh, what was referred to as the Mandal politics or OBC assertion, and I think uh, uh, again this was not the 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 stated aims and objectives of the of the study uh, and the papers, but I think there are one or two points that come out of it. Uh, for example, uh, there is if you look at the land concentration, of course, it has largely remained unchanged in. Uh, uh, in uh, Nayanagar, but you can see uh, a very, very different uh, caste and land structure in Katkuya today as compared to 30 years ago. And not only this, but even in terms of uh, access to land uh, through uh, leasing in or mortgage is far more possible now for uh, different EBC castes and Dalit castes in Katkuya than uh, in Nayanagar, which is more classically uh, Bhumihar uh, uh, landlord village. Uh, in fact, the institution of Rehan uh, or Bandhak or sort of a very unique sort of a arrangement of uh, uh, land mortgage in Katkuya uh, is a strange kind of institution because on the one hand it provides an opportunity for historically landless to gain access to land and uh, by the way, this is possible because of this historical connection with the Punjab village and long term migration that happens uh, from Katkunya to the Punjab village. And, and so this is uh, this is because of that cash flow into the village economy that many uh, EBC households are able to uh, gain access to land through leasing in in this in this uh, in this way. But at the same time, it is it is an institution that really only benefits the the landowners, and very you know it's a it's a very one sided arrangement if you think about it. Uh, it's the the details are in the paper. That's why I'm not uh, talking about what the institution is. And uh, yeah, so I think I, I these are the only two things that I wanted to say. Uh, and both are really not answers. Both are really more thoughts into into the process. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. Um, and uh, Madhura, have you, uh, would you like to comment briefly in response to uh, uh, the papers? Yeah, very, very briefly. And <laughs> has to be, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, some of the co-authors, if they have a minute or two, maybe that. Yeah. No, nice. we'll, we'll try to. Uh, uh, one Nothing. thing I want to say, not as an author, but, you know, from FAS is that Originally, this was planned as a book with you know discussions of migration and wage rates and everything else. And then finally, we said, okay, let's uh, you know get started by publishing a few papers. So I think I uh, take on the comments of uh, all the uh, discussants who are all Bihar experts. And uh, I must say, I know only these two villages. So I cannot I cannot speak for Bihar at all. That. Uh, there is more work in progress and we will uh, take into some of, in not all, perhaps it will be difficult, take some of your points, uh, which you have said in further work. Uh, two quick points, I think, Chirashi, I liked your point that, you know, there's continuity and change, um, but in terms of asset inequality, you know, there, there seems to be very, very, very little change. 
And I think uh, the asset poverty indicators that you mentioned, I think that's a very good point. And we can, you know, even if there is change, uh, you know, what is the minimal level that people have? And it's just so, so uh, low. The other point I wanted to make, which is not in the paper, but something that Shruti and I have worked on, is 50 households uh, between 2012 and 2018. And do we see any change in assets? And yes, we do. We see upward mobility also, even among EBCs and uh, Dalits. But of course, we see just going up to the next quintile, not going right to the top. But it is mainly because of improvements in housing. You know, so getting a little better, you know, their living conditions are getting a little better. I think there's one point that uh, Jerry and many others have raised, which is very important, is there are obviously social changes. If you go out, you migrate, some of them to Kerala, and you come back, you must be coming back with new ideas and new ways of thinking. And this is uh, leading to some kind of churning in that society. And this is something we have uh, probably not been able to capture, but is something that uh, I hope the younger scholars who are going to continue working on Bihar uh, will do so. Thank you, John. Very good, thank you. Now, could I ask other uh, others among the, uh, the co-authors co of the papers if uh, they would like to uh, comment briefly uh, in response to what has been said so far. Others, please come in. Mrityunjay, do you want to come in? Yeah. No. Hello. Hello. May I audible? Hi. Hi. Yeah. 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 So it's a really delightful moment for me that uh, as a young scholar in agrarian studies, I have grown up uh, reading the scholars and got interest in this area. All these uh, um, like scholars are commenting on a paper. It's like a big, I um, mean, it's a, such an insightful moment for me that, uh, and, I noted down all the comments and it will be really helpful for me because I'm doing my PhD also in the, these villages. <laughs> A few things that I like to discuss and mention here. One is uh, yeah. about the um, migration as Professor Madhra was mentioning that uh, initially it was a book plan and then few of the papers have come. Migration from this village has really interesting and uh, significant importance. As the work of IST has uh, discuss in large the role of migration in Bihar. They're not claiming that, that they have transformed the uh, villages in Bihar, but have uh, acted in a role of stimulate to change for the Bihar villages. But what I observed from the uh, analysis of data, uh, it's not published anyway, but that migration from these villages, in the both villages migrations, about 60% of households are engaging in migration, approximately. But yeah. for uh, Hardly for any household, migration has acted as a, any kind of transformative change. They are rather are playing a role of strategy to survive, to destitution, rather than bringing any transformative change in their class position in the village. Second, the, the uh, households in the village are not looking outward due to migration because migration is not providing any meaningful opportunity outside the village in the extreme destitution condition to survive they, they are moving out when earning something and looking back to village like many of the migrants are engaging in a tenancy in the village after gaining something from the migration savings and to uh, if chair allow i'll just give an example uh, a case to present my case so uh, Katkunya village has a historic migration channel towards a village in Punjab, Tehang, that village in the Jalandhar district. Uh, from late uh, 1960s, 70s, continuous migration happening to that village, and that's the pro most prominent migration channel from this village. Even the survey here, around more than 70 workers from the manual working and the poor page entry section has migrated to Tehang. I will present the case of the first migrant of the uh, from the Katkunya to Tehang to just to respond to Professor Roger, so what is the transformative change migration has brought to the pe uh, the people of the Bihar of, of these villages specifically. So Mr. Mia um, has migrated to 
Tehang in 1970. For 30 years continuously, he kept migrating in every season as an agriculture labor. In April, May, for sowing and harvesting of uh, uh, paddy and wheat, and then, then uh, November and December for the again sowing and harvesting of uh, paddy and wheat. Meanwhile, he uh, like he'll go in, uh, twice a year. He will be migrating to Punjab for 30 years. Means three decades, he kept migrating. In survey year, uh, we, uh, when we surveyed in 2012, he was at age of 75. He was vegetable seller in the village. His son has migrated as a, a non-agriculture labor to Goa. And when we saw the condition of the housing, they were uh, purely kacha house with a thatch, not even uh, pakka uh, wall they have. They didn't have kitchen, toilet, drinking water facility. And if you if you exclude the uh, value of homestead land, the total household asset value of this household is rupees four thousand in total. So this is this has brought this is a four decades of continuous migration has brought to that household, and it, it's not the extreme case I'm taking. I'm taking the, the case of the first migrant to present that this person who's migrated most in that village is in this condition, so we can imagine about the condition of others. Now, second, uh, when Chair has presented the uh, broader discussion about the, these villages and compared it, uh, compared it with the um, villages studied by the uh, Rogers and, the, and his colleagues, I mean, this is very rich data of 36 villages over three decades, and uh, Chakravarti's village study, that's also a multiple time study. And, a lot of parallels were drawn between these villages and this uh, conclusion from our studies and those studies. But few things that uh, have missed out in this uh, discussions that I like to point out that has uh, very much, I got interested in it. One is particularly the case of Nayanagar present a unique uh, case to me that uh, uh, chair and other panelists can comment on it. A village where I saw and got mesmerized by seeing the level of mechanization among the landlord and the page, rich peasantry section, that this kind of mechanization is even difficult to find out in some of like in the capitalist farmers of the Punjab, a landlord sitting in the house is uh, monitoring the field of of hundreds of acres through CCTVs, have a, uh, multiple combined harvesters, more than twenty tractors and all, and all kind of modern machinery he has at possession, and carrying generational more than 20 attached laborers. And this is not the case of one household, it's a general phenomenon of that village. I mean, con means in the terms of uh, mechanization, reaching a level of a, a green revolution in villages of Punjab, Haryana. But in terms of labor relation, it's the continuity of semi-feudal attached labor with uh, Jajmani kind of payment system is continuing. This is one point that's very un uh, that unique thing that I found out in this study, and I uh, we try to uh, bring it through our class paper. Other thing is the aggressive differentiation happening in this village that the conditioning of the uh, more than 70 80 percent of population is about the surviving the destitution. The peasantry is the a large chunk of peasantry is making negative income, and the uh, and due to nature of mechanization, the agriculture labor households are leaving, uh, is not getting enough uh, employment in agriculture, not get, and the development of non-agriculture is uh, very pathetic condition in, in and around the village. And migration is also not providing any alternative means. This has created a conditioning where one, the nature of capital is creating differentiation, other this uh, pauperization is creating condition where the more than 80 percent village in a destitution condition. Uh, and one last yeah, point, yeah, okay. uh, allow. Uh, one last point I'll mention. Okay. Uh, yeah, the chair has mentioned about the uh, effort often this uh, these villages with the Bernstein's uh, classification of classes of uh, labor. Yeah, of course, the economic condition of around the poor section of peasantry and the manual workers with cultivation and without cultivation seems very much similar. But when we see the cultural difference in being the cultivator in the village, the, that cultural change, the positioning in the uh, political scenario, the condition of household 
in a social and cultural uh, aspect comes when household cultivate and not cultivate have worth enough to separate the poor section of peasantry from the manual workers and study them separately mm -hmm. thank you thank you very much uh, we have already i think uh, run over uh, our scheduled time uh, which I think is not unusual <laughs> with uh, such a rich material uh, and uh, so many people uh, involved. Uh, may we go on for a few more minutes? Is that, uh, is that all right? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, people who have other, other commitments um, will necessarily leave, but perhaps we can go on for, for a, a, a few more minutes. Is that all right? Uh, and I have to leave us in about 15, 10, 15 minutes for another, right. yeah. Okay, Outer that's limit. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, one question has, uh, has come into the, uh, the Q&A here, um, uh, and I, I'd like to uh, ask this. This is a question uh, addressed to uh, Professor Ja, uh, you met from an anonymous attendee. You mentioned that the formulation of the agrarian question must be founded on an overarching encapsulation of global imperialism. In what ways do you think imperialism determines the nature of agrarian contradictions in rural Bihar? Is it your view that the nature of caste, class and caste struggle in Bihar villages must be defined as subservient to the contradictions thrown up by global imperialism? If so, how do you think the demands and slogans of the agrarian movement must be accordingly redefined? Oh, that's it's quite a big question. I think it's probably give me right on both sides of the paper. Uh, I mean, this this is subject matter of a paper itself. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Very briefly, you know, uh, if uh, uh, the person who has asked this question is interested, he can look at two of our contributions in. Agrarian South, the journal that you also mentioned, uh, in 2012 and 2013, basically our claim is that uh, the classical agrarian question was misconstrued in a very narrow manner by focusing on the issue of industrialization by some of our very, very well-known, respected Marxist academics. And, uh, you know, Henry Bernstein went on to su suggest that uh, the agrarian question is dead. You know, so our view is that if one looks at uh, from Marx and the first generation Marxists, it actually is a very, very rich canvas where issues of national sovereignty and a number of other issues, for lack of time, I'll, 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 let me not get into it is absolutely central to the classical conception of the agrarian question. Now, all that is discarded. You know, so for instance, Bernstein says that if uh, in the times of neoliberal globalization, capital is mobile, you can get it from anywhere, you can sort of solve the problem of industrialization and so on. Even if that would be, is, you know, if one takes that at the face value, yeah, whether that, that happens or not, industrialization in different countries, et cetera, um, is uh, uh, you know a serious question, but reducing it to industrialization itself is something yeah, which is a, a serious, serious uh, challenge. So Engels, Kotsky, Lenin, uh, I mean, one, one, one needs to get back to that. Uh, and in particular, the formulations uh, emerging from, let's say, Latin America, coming to the next generation from Axis, uh, sort of... Uh, Maria Tegi, subsequently Mao, and so on, the way they envision that uh, we find much more uh, helpful. Now, in all this, of course, the question of primitive accumulation, the question of imperialism is very integral. Right? But then how does it play out in different contexts, different parts of the world? That is a matter of a uh, lot of careful work and needs to be done. So I hope that for the moment serves the purpose. Chair. Thank you very much for that very uh, succinct answer to uh, uh, quite a, as you said, a complex question that uh, one could <laughs> write a substantial amount uh, uh, about. Um, I think uh, I have not found, I think, other questions. 
coming in from uh, uh, from those who participated uh, in the uh, in the discussion. Um, so perhaps I I can uh, draw our session to to a close. Um, I think perhaps to come back to uh, what uh, uh, Madhura Swaminathan uh, said uh, about the uh, the foundation's work in Bihar, um, there is uh, clearly you have a great deal of uh, of material, uh, and there are there's a lot more work that that can be done uh, with uh, with the with the material you have. And I think we should be very grateful to the commentators we've had today for for raising questions um, uh, that may be addressed, perhaps not all of them, but many of them I think can be addressed with the material uh, from the studies in Katkuyan and uh, and Neonaga. I mean, questions have been raised as well uh, about the, the the frameworks that have been employed. Uh, in uh, in your studies, uh, and I think uh, you will want to to reflect uh, upon those questions uh, about about framing. But I think it, it, it's certainly no criticism of the studies uh, that appear in the in focus section uh, in the review of agrarian studies that they. The papers don't deal with everything that, <laughs> that is significant uh, and worthy worthy of of discussion. I I, I hope that our uh, that our discussion uh, has um, really paid adequate tribute to the richness uh, of the uh, of the articles. So thanks to everybody, uh, uh, Professor Harris. Uh, so Sorry, to end. there are two more questions on the chat box. Oh, is there, are, there are two more questions. Uh, yeah, if, if you want to take them up, and up to you. Okay. Just, I'm so. sorry, I, I didn't find any um, any further questions in in the chat box. Um, in the chat box, uh, there are three. Like, I I uh, something is got something. Uh, it may be my my failure. But I'm not finding any more. Ah, now I am. Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't see the end. Okay, so if we have a few more minutes, uh, let's uh, let's go uh, go on. Um, some uh, from Vijesh uh, Mishra. Is there any relationship between agricultural efficiency and uh, and rural migration? Um, uh, that is an important an important question. I think that uh, you know, Praveen, uh, in your comments, you were rather asking uh, a, a, a question about the implications of findings for the dynamics of the agricultural economy. Um, Avanish or Neladri, would you like to uh, comment briefly in response to that question? Chair, may I take a just half a minute to say something on this yes, by citing Pranab Bardhan. Praveen. Pranab Bardhan in 1970s, early 70s, had mentioned that at the sort of you know early and very powerful wave of green revolution in Punjab, there were more people migrating out of Punjab than coming into Punjab. So, I mean, you know, it should not be reduced, basically what I'm trying to say, should not be reduced to some unidimensional sort of, you know, thinking yeah, about yeah. migration. Migration yeah, yeah. has so many issues there, it needs to be understood. Uh, and again, there's a huge literature which tells us that political, cultural, social, economic, etc. And in any case, what is efficiency? It is one of the most abused notions in economics. <laughs> yes. I think so we have me, to move me, to the me, next let, question. I just wanted to provoke, so let me just stop. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, another question. Um, under tenancy, any possibility of crop loss owing to natural calamities, and therefore the compensation is awarded to the landlord rather than the, the sharecropper. 
So should there be any provision of profit share or cost share to minimize the burden uh, on the sharecropper and what role should the state play to fix the rate, if at all? That is a very specific and uh, um, a very specific, and I'm not sure that, uh, Madura, is there material? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not really a question to be answered, I think, with reference to the material in the, in the surveys. Uh. I think if I can just say it's not in reference to this question, but you know, the complex forms of tenancy and the you know, new forms of tenancy, which are complex, which I think Avanish uh, referred to. Yeah. It's something, you know, so and many of these seem to have been generated by migration. And I think Avanish was very clear on that point that these new forms of tenancy is yes, because the return migrants have cash in hand. But at the end of the day, if you do the calculation, it's you can see that you know they're being exploited, if you just use a simple word. And I think that migration also, I mean, this is the contradiction that you have a village where you know perhaps the macro data is not showing agricultural growth, but there is change, at least among some classes, there's investment, mechanization, high productivity. So there is change. But even after that, the condition of the workers, whether they are those who have remained in the village or have migrated for some time is, I mean, in, as if we looked at just assets, we haven't looked at incomes here, but is abysmal poverty. So I think uh, th these are the contradictions and uh, uh, which I hope, as I said, again, I'm, I'm not uh, looking at other Bihar villages, looking at these villages over time, uh, looking at other, you know, changes around in the economies around the villages, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, others in the FAS team will work on this and explore these questions. Well, Thank small you. Small point here. Uh, sorry. No, Please? go on. No. Okay. Go. Now, go on. one small point that uh, most of the cases, uh, the tenancy relations are unregistered. So they are not registered with any... Uh, uh, you know, uh, government agencies or etc. So I don't think there is, you know, the state will do any, you know, make any, any provision. Possibility of compensation, yeah. Compensation or something, you know, something like that. Yeah. No, that's In fact, right. uh, uh, almost hundred percent are unregistered. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. Um, th thanks, Nila. Uh, I think we should come yeah. to the th the third question we have from Jayan uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, Jayan says, the secondary data, NSS, um, PLP, uh, PLFS surveys, suggest that rural Bihar has been going through significant changes over the past two decades. Share of agricultural workforce in total workforce declined from 72% in 2004-05 to 43% in 1718. And the growth of rural wages in Bihar has been one of the fastest in India. Um, any comments on these trends based on your village studies? Um, Niladri, uh, perhaps you'd like to, uh, to comment first on- So uh, on we have to write a paper on, uh, on these two villages to answer these questions because uh, uh, we have not, uh, in the, you know, I just uh, mentioned it clearly that Till now, we have not seen wages of the uh, of these villages at all. Okay, whatever we have done for the class analysis and etc., but the details of wages and what forms of wages and the levels of wages we have not done. We have not seen. Uh, probably, you know, in uh, next paper, next paper will be on employment and wages on Bihar two villages of Bihar. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, right. So there's can, there's can I say a quick thing? Yeah. your mills there. Yeah. Uh, Madhura. So very quick to I think in a point that Jerry made in the end about mobile phones. So we yeah. had a you know COVID post pandemic telephonic survey, and Professor Ushikawa is uh, here. She uh, uh, she was part of uh, analyzing the data on school education. And you can see that in government schools, it's published in uh, RAS, uh, in Bihar, 
the number of children not getting access to any online education is more than the number getting access. Whereas in many other states, Maharashtra, Tampa, Kerala, it's the other way around. So I think uh, there's change, but then the kind of overall deprivation that's coming out, I think, of the uh, FAS studies, at least to me, um, in 2012, but even in 2018 and 2021, uh, is something that sort of just uh, stays with you. And uh, of course, we have to look at it historically, have to look at the other studies and look at comparative material. Uh, so all the points are well taken. But I think that's something the uh, continued forms of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the uh, basic deprivation in education, housing, I mean, so many forms of deprivation in, in uh, rights of tenants and uh, rights to land, to homestead land, which we didn't discuss today. Uh, is something that is quite uh, shocking for someone who's not worked in Bihar before. Thank you. Uh, may I just make one point here, not, not Professor actually, Harris, not, if, not, if I may? To comment on, the, uh, on your study for the, uh, uh, the in-focus issue. Yeah? Sandeep, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Harris. Just one point, in fact, uh, you know, on this uh, on this bit about continuity and change, I think the paper on homestead landlessness certainly points to continuity of uh, unfreedoms. And the interesting bit about this paper is this was not something that we were looking at. You know, and this is uh, this is not something that we were looking for when we were you know analyzing the data. It was a uh, you know a protest led by the All India Kisan Sabha in uh, uh, the district of Sitamari, which made us look up and sort of realize that uh, uh, this unfreedom continues in the state. And uh, it was with that cue that we started looking at our data and realized, so you know, this is just to say that while this is certainly, uh, you know, our data is confined to two villages, but our paper, uh, you know, the, the motivation of this paper uh, originated from somewhere that was uh, from from the same issue that was uh, prevalent and that was being protested uh, by the present organizations in elsewhere in Bihar. So really, the the bit of uh, continuity is not confined to two villages. Something that we can be a little more confident of. So that would be my only uh, comment here. Sir. Thanks so much. I'm very glad that you came in like that, and I think I'm uh, remiss. Actually, drawn attention to uh, to your paper because I think that uh, you know the, the whole question of, of ownership of, of house sites um, that uh, is uh, is extraordinarily important and has historically uh, been uh, been neglected. Though it is something that that the foundation has been concerned with and reflecting, uh, as you've said. Um, the concerns which have been expressed um, by rural people themselves. Uh, hey, I, uh, uh, okay, uh, we've got, a, should we just say another five minutes and then uh, we'd better sort of draw a, draw a line, well, Jerry. Well, I, just want, yeah, so, I just wanted to make one <laughs> quick response to Jan Joseph Thomas's uh, uh, question about rural wages, because in, in two villages which we had um, studied at about the same time as these Parry villages, um, in one of them, real agricultural wages had been multiplied by three in 30 years, and in the other, they had been multiplied by two. So I think um, you, you cannot have that sort of change in real wages without it having a substantial impact on the agrarian system. So I think the paper that you are planning to write on, on wages and employment is going to be very important. Good. <laughs> Professor Good. Harris, there is another okay. question. Yeah. <laughs> no, there is another question. Ah, there is another, another question. Uh, that has come up in, into, uh, hey, we can go on. Um, but I'm sorry, I didn't okay. get it. Um, come up. If you allow me, can I respond okay. to a question uh, on tenancy and migration? Yeah. Can, May I can, just say thank okay. you? And I have to leave you because to leave. I'm in exactly. another panel discussion in two, three minutes. Uh -huh. So, Praveen, thank, thank you. you. Take this one minute. <laughs> okay, um, so no, no, in any case, I'm leaving. So, yes. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank FAS. You.
for this wonderful <laughs> issue in focus, uh, you know, on behalf. Thank you. Bye-bye. Exactly. Now I leave. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Praveen. Good. Um, I think uh, with a Apologies, oh. I think I should. Yeah, yeah. Uh, should yeah. just. Yeah, just uh, my observations. Yeah. Now this last, I'll no. look at this last question, and then I think we really do have to draw a line. Uh, to yes, all yes, I will. Relation between cultivators, means of communication, and access to public institutions, schemes, programs in, in these uh, villages. Uh, did the study bring out the means and mode of communication of farmers with state institutions? I, I mean, I think uh, this is really, uh, you know, another, uh, another question uh, that is you know, significant uh, and important, uh, but it is not dealt with, uh, understandably, uh, in, the, uh, in the five papers in the Review of Agrarian Studies in, the, in, the, in Focus. So I think uh, I suggest that we uh, thank Rakesh Naniwar for, for the question and refer it to, uh, to the members of the PARI team uh, as a question that they might wish to, to consider uh, in future work on the, uh, the Bihar papers. With that, I, I really think we, uh, uh, we have to uh, draw a line under the discussion. Um, thanks to uh, the three commentators. Thanks to all those who, uh, uh, the authors, co-authors uh, of the five papers that have been published. Uh, I think we want to congratulate you on the work that you've done um, uh, and to, yes, encourage you to, to continue uh, with the uh, the analysis of this very rich data that you have uh, from the two village studies. So with that, um, good evening, good night, um, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, 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 Pro Professor Harris, uh, may I, uh, may I, may I uh, call upon Alia Shahar for the vote of thanks? Yeah, Alia, over to you. Alia? Am I audible? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sandeepin. Uh, so I am Alia Sel, the editorial coordinator for Review of Agrarian Studies, the peer-reviewed journal of the Foundation for Agrarian Studies. On behalf of the Foundation as well as the Review, I would like to extend our thanks to the chair of the symposium, Professor John Harris, and our discussants, Professor Praveen Cha, Professor Chirashree Das Gupta, and Professor Jerry Rogers, for having agreed at relatively short notice to participate in the symposium. The discussion certainly has enriched the perspective on agrarian relations in Bihar and would hopefully reflect in future studies. I'm certain that you all will take some time and go through the research articles on Bihar in RAS Volume 12, Number 1, available at ras.org.in. <laughs> I would also like to thank the authors of the Bihar In Focus series for their participation and, of course, our audience. I thank the director of the foundation, Sandeepin, for initiating the idea of this discussion. And most importantly, a special thanks to our online events team, including Deepak, Tapas, Setu, and Kulvinda, ably led by Sujan, our communication and events coordinator, for their relentless effort in organizing and promoting the event. I also thank Aru from Free Software Movement of Karnataka for his support in conducting this event. We hope to have many more symposiums like this one in the future. And may I humbly request you to subscribe to our journal if you have not already registered. We'll be grateful if you encourage your institutions and departments to subscribe to the physical copy of the journal as well. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And bye to everybody. Bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. much.